church. Uh, man, I just, I love the spirit of worship that goes on here. I really do. I really love the spirit of worship, and I just really appreciate, man, every time. You know, there are people that go to church, and they have what I would call a spiritless experience. And I'm not talking about a Pentecostal experience. I'm talking about where it is void of the presence and the power of God. And I don't ever take for granted that we're part of a church where God shows up every single week. Amen? Yeah, I'm, I'm really I'm really excited about that, that we are I'm a part of a church that Jesus actually will come to and comes to every single week. So Jesus makes it a part of his rounds on Sundays. And can and not on the floor and so um, I'm walking out of outside of Buffalo Wild Wings and there's this piece of paper that's there and so I've been down customarily to pick it up and I see that it's a church card um, of uh, Elevation STL and Pastor Dan's card and so I know how it feels to be a church planner nobody it, it takes a church planner it takes a very special person to start a church you, you got to be a special kind of crazy to want to start a church and so when I seen the card, I just decided to go back to my office and send him an email of encouragement just to say, hey, listen, I found your card on the ground. Just want you to be encouraged. And if, welcome to St. Louis. And if you need any help or encouragement or anything like that, feel free to uh, hook up. So we started having coffee. We started connecting. And next thing you know, uh, he's here. And so I'm really excited about this four or five year span of time that the Lord has decided that today would be the day that Pastor Dan Thomas will come and speak to us the word of God. So would y'all just give him a great big hand as Pastor Dan Thomas from Elevation Church STL comes to speak to us this morning. Come on, give Jesus a hand, praise and him a hand. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I always think about that. He, Antoine was my, Pastor Antoine was my first friend <laughs> in St. Louis. And so uh, it was good to, to move to a place and, and know that uh, there were people pulling in the same direction as you, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, I always think about that story from a place of God's providence. In other words, that he is bigger and badder and stronger than anything we have going on in our life. And, and that he has an amazing ability to maneuver and move people into positions to be a blessing. And, uh, and it was just uh, one of those things that I thank God for, yeah. you know, because you don't plan on that. God does it. You didn't have anything to do with it. He did it. And, and so you can't even take credit for it. And so that's good. Would you guys pray with me as we start? God, we thank you so much for today. I know that you have a word for your people. I know that uh, all of us in here come with a particular amount of need, whether we recognize it or not. But we do believe that you can fill our cup. You can make up the difference. You can fill the gap. And so, Lord, would your word be strong and powerful? May it be active alive in here. May it be nourishment for our soul. Because the truth is, God, we need you. And so would you come and dwell among your people? Would you teach us? Would you make us better? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, I'd like to just start by reading some scripture. Is that okay? All right, so I'm going to be in Luke chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 5. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to be, my Bible is uh, the New Living Translation. So I, I don't know what you have, but. I assume some of it will be on the screen. All right. So so Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to start. You know, I believe that there's power in the word of God. Just when we speak it, that there's power in it. And so I'm excited to just share just this passage of scripture. And then I'll do my best to share a little bit that's, uh, that God's put on my heart. Okay? 
All right, so Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and I'm just going to read through uh, verse 11. One day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and great crowds passed. And great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Because, you know, when Jesus speaks, people listen. They press in. They, they, they're, they're, right? So, that, so Jesus was speaking, and great crowds were pressing in to listen to the word of God. Verse 2. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Why are you washing your nets? You're done for the day. Right? They had worked hard. They're done for the day. Verse 3. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner. Now, this is Peter. Simon, Peter. He said, he, he, he says to Simon, he says to Simon, push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from the boat. Because they were pressing on it. They were pressing on it. They were getting, you know, they were pushing in. And Jesus was like, well, I got to back up. And so he sits in the boat and he begins to share with the crowd. So that's the picture. Can you picture it? And so he's sitting there in this boat teaching the people. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it's deeper. Go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some more fish. To catch some fish. Verse 5. Master, Jesus replied. Now I'm going to get back to that word master. That's an important word. It says, we worked hard all night and didn't catch anything. You ever work hard all night and feel like you never got anywhere? <laughs> so he said, we didn't catch anything. But then Peter, having just enough faith, says, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Verse 6, and this time their nets were so full of fish that it began to tear. Because, <laughs> you know, Jesus plus anything is, that's crazy. That's abundant. That's something that we can't even explain. Jesus shows up and tells them to let down their net, and all of a sudden their net begins to tear. And say in verse 7, a shout for help. They shouted for help, Right? Because it says that they brought their partners in. So there were other boats. There were a few other boats. And, and they knew that right there, that things were getting out of hand. And so they had to call in some help. That's the kind of abundance that's happening here. They needed help. And so they call in their friends. And then it says, and soon both boats were filled with fish. Now listen, listen. Listen to this. you got to hear it. And they were on the verge of sinking. They were on the verge of sinking. Now, this is good. I'm going to get back to this. That's what the whole message is about. But just remember that. They were on the verge of sinking. Verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees and he, before Jesus and he said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. <laughs> I know I felt like that in the presence of a holy God. I don't always feel holy. The good news is that Jesus is holy. And when we say yes to him, he gives us his righteousness. It is not your righteousness. It's Jesus's righteousness in you. And you can bank on that, count on it. You didn't do nothing to deserve it. It's, it's, it's a gift. So, so, so Peter, though, is right. He's absolutely right. I'm a sinner. I got to get out of here. The gospel says that with Christ, we can be in his presence. So he goes on to say, oh, Lord, leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. Verse 9. For he was what? Awestruck by the number of fish they had caught. And where, sorry, they were awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. 
verse 10, his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, it says, were also amazed. Because see, when Jesus does something like this, people stand there like this. Right? I mean, that's a miracle. That's, that's something you're like, whoa, that doesn't happen every day. This guy's different. Something's going on that I've never seen before. This guy's different. And they were just getting into this. They weren't quite sure yet. But then listen to this. It says, Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. Man, I can't tell you how many times in this life I've been afraid. Maybe it's because I was messed up or people were messed up, but I've been afraid. Jesus says, don't be afraid. And then he says this, from now on, you'll be fishing for people. Verse 11, and then he says, and as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I just have a few things to say, if that's all right. I believe that we are always on a verge of something. We're always on a verge of something. Now, sometimes we're on the verge of something bad. I mean, it's not always good, but, but here's the truth. We can be on the verge of something good, or we can be on the verge of something bad. And I'm sure that you've heard that phrase. You've probably said that phrase. Like, for example, that person was on the verge of a breakthrough. That person was on the verge of a breakdown. So we use this phrase. We understand it. But this is the thing I want to get to. There's something about this little nugget of truth that's on the verge of sinking that God just began to shake me up with. And I know this may be a little too much information. They call that TMI. Is that right? Sometimes I pray in the shower. I know that some of y'all are like, I didn't want to know you showered. Well, I do. I don't want that image, but I got to get clean. So I'm in the shower, and I'm praying, and I'm, I'm asking God about some things. And, and it was kind of like, God, what do you want me to say? And it was in that shower that that phrase came, on the verge. Like I was just like, I never read this passage of scripture, but it was just on the verge. Now you go to other translations, and it doesn't say that. But in the New Living, it says on the verge. And I looked it up, and there are two places in the New Living that it says it. The first is in Psalms 38, 17. And this is one of those things that we understand. I was on the verge of a collapse. So Psalms, a lot of times we know about Psalms. Psalms sometimes just communicates our heart. It's the feelings that we sometimes need to express to the Lord. And right here, that psalmist is saying, man, I am in trouble. I am sinking. I am on the verge of a collapse. But then I went over to Luke and I found this other one. Luke chapter 5. And I think it's interesting if you read it, it says, I was on the verge of sinking. And when if you look at it outside of the context, you may think, well, I don't want to sink. They're on the verge of sinking. Who wants to sink? If you're in a boat in the middle of the ocean, do you want to sink? No. But as you examine this, you start to discover that the fact that they were on the verge of sinking was a good thing. It was a good thing. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the fact that, that sometimes in our life, when we are not in control, because I'm, I'm sure nobody in here has control issues. <laughs> when we get to a place in our life where we are not in control, I love it because that's exactly the place often that God wants us. Because we, we, we begin to forget. We start to remember that, that I'm not as cool as I think I am. I'm not as strong as I think I am. I can't handle everything on my own. We start to remember that truth. Now listen to this. I believe, this is what I believe, this is what I want to say to you. I believe this church, Equation Church, is on the verge of something great. I believe that. I believe that 
that Equation Church is on the verge of something great, not because you're great, but because Jesus is great. Right? Jesus is greater, always and forever. And if he's in you, then that means you can be great too. Now, I'll give this to you. These are just, you're like, you know what, sometimes we have no takers. I'm going to give you some of the stuff I'm going to talk about right at the front. You ready? This is, this is what I believe that I've learned from this passage of scripture, and it's going to help you in your relationship with God. But here it is. I am always on the verge of something great because Jesus is great and he lives in me. Does that make sense? I am always on the verge of something great because Jesus is great and he lives in me. Here's the other one. Greater harvest is always coming because he is the Lord of the harvest. You're not in charge of the harvest. Your job is to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers to be able to gather the harvest. God is the one that brings the growth. You don't. You don't bring the growth. You simply do what he told you to do. You plant the seeds. You do the things. But God brings the growth. The Bible says all by itself it grows. Because everything God makes has integrity. And if he makes something to grow, it's going to grow. And he made the church to grow. And so greater harvest is always coming because Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And then this is the last thing I want to say that you'll get. And then I'm going to preach a little. Is that all right? Jesus will bring greater harvest. But this greater harvest must drive us, listen, to greater dependency so that it can be sustained continuously. Now hear that. Jesus will bring greater harvest, but this greater harvest has to lead us to greater dependency. Not more me, less me, more Jesus. So greater dependency so that, so that it can be sustained continuously. And I believe that with 100% of who I am, that you can sustain this in your life. Not because you're having a good day. But because Jesus is the Lord of the day. He's the Lord of the harvest. And so we've got to get our head wrapped around this. Now, my son, Caleb, he's seven years old. I, I love him because he's great for sermon material. <laughs> he's just great. I, t I told two stories on him just a little bit ago at my church. But my son, you take him, like, you ever been to them uh, arcade place down in Fenton? We have this place called Swing Around Fun Town. You go in, they take all your money, and you play some video games that are overpriced. You know what I'm talking about. There's this one game. It, it's kind of like a slot machine or something. But you like you put your money in. You hit the slot machine arm. And it, you know, it goes, and it's lights. And my son has an amazing ability to hit the jackpot every time. Like one day, I'm serious, he did it like three times in a row. I'm like, I'm taking this kid to Vegas. <laughs> but I mean, there was this mother load, this jackpot. And that's what the disciples are seeing. Without Jesus, they had nothing. No fish at all. And then Jesus shows up and all of a sudden there's a jackpot. There's a mother load that's coming. The nets are overflowing. The fish are popping out of the boat. They're calling in help because they are on the verge of sinking. They are on the verge of sinking. And that's the picture. I hope you see it. They're on the lake, and this is what's happening. So I want to talk to you a little bit about living on the verge of greatness. Living on the verge of greatness. Because, see, I think there's a lot in this passage of Scripture that Jesus is trying to teach us. Because do you know this? When things get hard, we want to quit. We want to quit too early. When Jesus says take another lap, we want to sit down. We want to quit too early. We don't want to grow deeper. The reason we don't want to go deeper is because it's deeper. We like swimming in the kiddie pool. We like where we can touch. We don't want to go deeper. 
Imagine we can't swim. And most of us struggle in faith when it comes to swimming in faith. <laughs> we don't want to follow his lead. Master, no. And so we want to quit. We want to get out of it. But let me tell you this. Jesus loves you. And he will never ask you to do something. Never ask you to do something that doesn't have your best interest in mind. And sometimes we have an image of Jesus, we have an image of God that somehow he's out to get us. He's always out there trying to hurt us or harm us. He's not trying to hurt or harm you. He's trying to help you. And so when we see this, we need to tune in. Listen to this. This is in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. I shared it a little bit. I just wanted to point out a few things. It says Jesus was preaching. People were pressing in. Did you notice the two empty boats? There were two empty boats. That's important as we get a little bit further into the story. And then it says, then he says this, Peter says this to, or Jesus says this to Peter. Hey, I want you to push out into the water. He didn't want to stay in the shallow end. He didn't want to keep just staying in the shallow end preaching. He said, push out the deeper water. Push out the deeper water. Jesus, and Simon's like, all right. Now he wasn't like, yeah. Uh-uh. If you notice the big butt here. It says, but if you say so, there's a little bit of doubt in there. But since you're Jesus, I'll do it. I'm pushing out to deeper water. And so he sat in the boat and he talked to people. Listen to this. The first thing is that we've got to go deeper with Jesus. Some of us have been playing in the kiddie pool way too long. You've been in church all your life. You may be religious, but you have no power. we got to go deeper if we ever want to experience what we're talking about here. Greater harvest with greater dependence continuously in our life. You've got to be willing to go deeper. It says in verse 4, when you finish speaking to them, he said to Simon, you've got to go out deeper. And then he said, let down your nets and catch some fish. They were cleaning their nets earlier. They had worked all day. They were tired. They were tired. They were washing up, cleaning out the boat. We're done, going home, getting a snack, sitting by the fire. And Jesus says, no, we're not done. you got to go deeper. you got to push out. Because, see, sometimes when things get hard or when we are tearing and we're just pushing and we're plowing, what happens is that sometimes we just get tired and we want to sit down and quit. I've been tired. There are many days I just want to sit down and quit. And as a pastor, you know, you, you do your thing and you preach as good as you can. And sometimes people don't show up. But you keep going. Not because you are getting your need met by, oh, look at me, I got a lot of people. No, no. You're being faithful to just do what God has told you to do. And you just keep pressing. You keep pressing. You're going deeper with Jesus. Now, that's good. Number two, don't quit. Listen, verse five. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night. We got here at 1030. We swept up the nasty stuff on the floor. From the night before, Jesus. We've been doing this for years, Jesus. When's it going to give? When's this pastor going to get us a building? When's this going to happen, Jesus? I just want to quit. Oh, I'm sure none of y'all have said that like Israel. Murmuring, complaining. Well, I can't. How long are you going to keep us here? You just want to quit. I'm, going, I'm sorry. I'm going to meddling. But you notice this. He says, Master. Now, people that weren't Jesus' disciples, they referred to him as teacher. There's a difference between a teacher and a master, isn't there? Teachers teach you things. Take it or leave it. 
Now, when you're in a relationship with a master, though, that means you are not in charge. The master is in charge. And when you think about Jesus here, Simon is communicating something. It's no longer what I want. It's what you want. He must increase, and I must decrease. He's Lord. I am not. My job is to surrender to his will. My job is to do whatever he tells me. My job is to push out to deeper water and keep sweeping because he is the Lord of the harvest. And I believe this church is on the verge. This church is on the verge. God wants to do something, but the question is, are you willing to take another lap? Are you willing to not quit? Are you willing to put your faith in God and not in your circumstances? Verse number three, recognize who always brings the harvest. I've said it before. Are you getting it? And this time, listen, and this time your nets were so full of fish. I love that. So full of fish. They began to tear. Oh, I hope that somebody in this room gets this. God can bring the increase. God can fill your net. You know, sometimes we think people are there to sustain us. Sometimes we think it's our marriage. Sometimes we think it's our spouse, our wife, our husband, our friend. You know, somebody else. No, 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 no. Jesus is your source. He is the one that is there to sustain you. He is the one that will bring the increase. He is the one that will fill your net. It's nobody else. And when we rely on somebody else to be our source, we will always be disappointed. Because last time I checked, people disappoint us. They will. I will. Somebody else will. But Jesus won't. He's always there, on time, every time. He'll give you everything you need at exactly the right time. You know, we used to say this, you know, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. You didn't know I knew that. in a black church, so this hold on. I know, I know. So recognize that he's the Lord of the harvest and that you can be on the verge of sinking. And I think it's a great thing to be on the verge of sinking when Jesus is in charge. I think that's great because you're not in control. He's doing his thing and you're just saying, yeah, 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 where you want me, where you want me. Master, wherever you need me. That's what it means to be on the verge of sinking on the verge of sinking because you can't control it. Your nets are going crazy. you got to get help. That's what God wants to bring to this church. I believe that. I believe God wants to fill your net. Overflowing. Woo! Full of fish. Tearing. Need more help. Did you notice the two boats? They weren't there for a reason. They were there for a reason. It's not a coincidence. They had to call in help. We need help. There's too many fish. We need help. Somebody help us. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. Too many fish on the verge of sinking because the harvest is so big. Now listen to this. It's never a waste of time to be obedient to Jesus. Did you hear? It was never a waste of time to be obedient to Jesus. And so if Jesus has called you to something, you just need to be faithful. You just need to be obedient because it is not a waste of time. How can we even think that serving our great king who gave everything for us could be a waste of our time? Even though we feel like, that God, I don't want to sweep this floor anymore. But if God has called you to sweep the floor, then you need to sweep it. And realize that every hour, minute, second, whatever is being stored up in heaven is being stored up for the kingdom. And it will bring a harvest because Jesus is in charge of the harvest, not you. Number four, be awestruck and amazed by your God. I think sometimes we get so comfortable with Jesus. Now, he's your friend. We just sang about it. He's your friend. But he's still king. 
When you get in his presence, quite frankly, when I get in the presence of Jesus, I'm like Peter. I'm a dirty sinner. I, I'm a dirty sinner. I'm in trouble. That's what Peter says. He's like, I'm in trouble. I'm in the presence of something great. I can't even sustain it. I need to get out of here. But we need to be awestruck and amazed by our great God because that's what he said. He said he was awestruck by Jesus, but not just with who Jesus was, but what, by what he did. You know, in the scriptures, they call this a the theophany. That's kind of a fun word, isn't it? Theophany. It makes me sound smart. <laughs> the root word is theos, which is God. In other words, there was a miracle happening. And you know what miracles are for? They're not for you. Miracles are to give glory back to God. That's why he does them. They're meant to make everybody in the room do this. Now, sometimes we get just petty with miracles. You know, it's like, well, that was a miracle. I got my car. I mean, I got my car. Uh, the, my, uh, what is it? The, the, shoot. What's that called? You know, you pull in. Yeah, there it is. Parking spot. I'm sorry. All is a miracle. I got my parking spot. Now, maybe it was. But miracles are there to point us to Jesus. Miracles are there to make us go, ah. Oh. Miracles are there to cause us to repent of our sin in the light of a holy God. Miracles are there to cause us to be like, something's better than this of my life. My life is nothing compared to this. i got to get some of this. Mm -hmm. That's what miracles are supposed to do. So Jesus was doing a miracle in front of these people, and they were awestruck. And it says that James and John, sons of Zebedee, were a what? Amazed. Amazed. When was the last time you were amazed by God? Man. When was the last time God just showed up to your world and you just sat there like this? Now listen, I'm not saying that you've done something wrong. I'm just saying that you can do something right. And what you can do right is you can go deeper. You can press in. You can't fix all the stuff you've done or where you've been. God can. But the one thing I know is that you can take that step towards him today. When we get in trouble, often we walk away from God. And we need to get turned towards God. You know, I, I was sharing with my, my church the other day this image that Jesus, I felt like Jesus gave me. I had some friends growing up that were hearing impaired. And I, I took sign language and stuff and tried to communicate. But one of the things I was always amazed by is that they can read lips. That's, that's fascinating to me that people can read lips, you know. But, you know, if you weren't talking to them, they, they may take your face and, you know what I'm saying? So that they could see your lips. Like they needed to see it, so they, they'd pull you over. But see, what happens in our relationship with God often is that we're the ones with the hearing problem. We're the ones with the hearing problem. And what happens is that we turn like this. God's over here. We're over here. And God has to kind of like. So that we can see him. Because we can't always hear him. Because we got all kinds of noise in our life. But when Jesus says, you got to get turned towards me. you got to keep your eyes on me. The author and the perfecter of your faith. Going deeper with Jesus. When you get there, you can read his lips. You can hear his voice, even if you can't hear it audibly. But you can see it because his word talks to you. Maybe that'll help you a little, but we gotta go deeper. And then I'll just end with this. I know you're getting tired. You're getting tired. We need to devote our life to following and fishing. I don't know if any of you like to fish. Y'all like anybody fish out here? Yeah, got a couple fishers out there. That's good. I like to fish, but but it says, listen, we gotta devote our life to. Following and fishing. Did you notice how it ended? So Jesus does this great miracle. He fills their boat on the verge of sinking. Yeah, yeah. Boats, craziness, fish everywhere, nets tearing. And he ends with this in 10 and 11. It says, Jesus replied to Simon, Simon, you don't need to be afraid of me. You don't need to be afraid. 
I know that if I was standing there and this started to happen, I'd be a little nervous. If I was like Israel and I was coming up to the Red Sea and all of a sudden the thing parted, I'd be a little nervous. Because you know in the Bible it says that we should fear the Lord. Now I know that we get all twisted up. It's like, you know, well, I don't want to be scared of God. Well, look, God shows up, he might be a little nervous. So Jesus shows up and, and Peter's like, and then Jesus says this to him, don't be afraid. I love this. There's somebody in the room needs to hear this. There's somebody in the room today that needs to hear the fact that you don't need to be afraid. You don't have to, you don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to, to, to delete all of the history of the enemy. You don't need to be scared anymore. Because you know where Jesus is, there's light. And wherever there's light, darkness has to flee. And the good news is that when the darkness flees, Jesus is still there with you. When everybody else left you, Jesus is there. So you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. Now, you sometimes need to be afraid of people. Because people will mess you up. But you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. And he's telling you right now, hear it, hear it, hear it. Don't be afraid. Come to him. Don't walk away from him. Don't get your face turned. Get close. Focus. Because he wants you to be with him. So don't be afraid. Then he says, from now on, you'll be fishing for people. So he takes the fish. You see what he did. That Jesus. He's clever. He's clever. He takes real fish turns it into people fish. Clever. Clever. So he says from now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, listen, as soon as they landed, they left what? Everything. They left everything and followed Jesus. I love that. I love to think about what would it look like for my life to be like that? That when God said jump, I jump. When he said move, I move. When he said walk, I walk. When he said run, I ran. When he said stop, I stopped. When he told me to shut my mouth, I said okay. Wouldn't it be amazing to live like that? Surrender to the king completely. Jesus demands everything simply because he has given everything. Does that make sense? Like he can demand everything from you because he gave everything for you. That's the truth. We can trust him. We can count on him. We don't ever have to wonder. And I'm going to say something to you that I just found, I found amazing. So this is, what, this is the ministry that he's given you. The ministry that he's given you is not just to go deeper with him, not just to get, like I call this getting spiritually fat. We come to church. We study the Bible. We go to Bible studies. We learn. We grow. We get all kinds of knowledge because the Bible says knowledge puffs up. We get all kinds of knowledge. We get all kinds of stuff in us. And, and maybe, just maybe, over time, we become self-righteous Christians because we know and we know all the things. And, and, you know, you get me. You get me. We eat and eat and eat. And we just eat it. I love the Bible. Eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. What happens if you eat and you don't exercise? Come on. You get spiritually fat. And there are a lot of people in this world that are spiritually fat because they're not exercising and doing what God has called them to do. They say, I'm in. I love you, God. I'll study your word, but please don't tell me to share my faith with somebody. Please don't call me to ask somebody to come to church. Please don't call me to run into that building and save somebody. No, 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 I don't want to do that. You know, that's too much, Jesus. Jesus gave everything, and therefore he can demand everything. And there's the good news. Jesus takes live fish, live fish, who eventually will, will be dead. Right? You fish, you usually kill them. Live fish, who eventually will be dead. God's plan for us, his heart, his ministry for each one of us is God's plan is this, that we are fishing for dead people who will eventually be alive. Come on. Do you see it? He has called you to a ministry of reconciliation. He has called you to a ministry of healing. He's called you to walk into dead places and be light. That's what he wants. That's what he wants to give you. 
And I always get mad at people when they say, you all act Christians, they're just a bunch of boring people. It's no fun. They're just a bunch of killjoys. They never have a... Nah, 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 nah. Look, you want the greatest victory of your life. You surrender yourself to Jesus and watch what he does. Watch what he does in your life. He will take you places that you can't even imagine. He will do things in your life that you never thought possible. He will take your uneducatedness and make you great. He will make you amazing. He'll take your brokenness and turn it into something great. Because again, he is the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that is on the verge. He is the one that is bringing the verge. I need some verge. I want some greatness in my life. God wants to bring that into your life. The nets are going to overflow in this church. The nets are going to overflow in your life. Do you believe that? Do you have faith? Bunch of dead people coming to life. I love that. I don't, I don't have much more to say. But I do know this. I know that there are some in this room that need to go deeper. You've been playing the game. You've been playing it too long. It's time to get real. It's time to get right. Some of you are afraid. Some of you have been hiding. You've been in the dark too long, and the devil has just been whooping your rear end. Because did you know the devil's job is to get you isolated so he can pick you up? The darkness consumes us. And I love the fact that Jesus is light. He comes into your darkness. He comes in and he does amazing things. Would you let him today? Would you allow that to happen? Maybe you have needs. I don't know what they are, but God does. And he's able to do abundantly more than you can ever imagine. He will fill your net. He's going to fill the net of this church. I believe that in faith, that someday you guys are going to call me, and you're going to call me for help. And you know why you're going to call me for help? Because the harvest is too great. You're going to be like, damn, we need another boat. We need another boat in equation because God has been filling our nets. Lives are being changed. The people in this room have taken it upon themselves to be responsible with the mission that God has called you to. To bring light where there's darkness. To bring life where there's death. He wants you to be fishers of people. Love that. That's your call. If you claim the name of Jesus, that's your call. Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. Maybe you're in a place in your life where you've never said yes to Christ. And I want to be able to offer you that. And so would you guys pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that we come all with needs. Some of us in the room, we just need to come back to you. Some of us in the room, we just need to say, I'm sorry. Some of us in the room, we have a need that is pressing right now. And if you don't show up, we are in trouble. Some of us in the room are living in darkness and we need your light. God, we need you. Perhaps there's somebody here today that's ready to step across that line for the first time and say, Jesus, I can't do it on my own. I need you. I need you in my life. Would you, would you help me? So with heads bowed and eyes closed, just for a moment, if you fall into any of those categories of need or desire, what I want you to do, heads bowed, eyes closed, just lift up your hand because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Do you have a need? Maybe you're ready to take a step across the line. Yes, I see your hand. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else want to make that commitment? I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Let me pray for us, God. I pray right now favor over this church. I pray for your anointing to be on, to be on Antoine. That you would anoint him for the ministry you've called him to. God, that you would bring a harvest in this place. That everybody stands awed and amazed, locked jawed at you. Because you have done something great. God, would you bring that harvest? Would you bring that blessing? Would you be greater than this community? Would you be greater than the brokenness? Would you be greater than the bondage? Would you be greater than the, the, the drugs? Would you be greater than the stuff that gets in the way? And out of this church, God, you would start a holy movement into the community that they would bring, they would bring life, 
Hallelujah. Yeah. God, I pray specifically for every person in this room that says, I have a need. Lord, would you meet that need? Would you show up at exactly the right time? Would you give us faith to trust you? Would you give us faith to believe that you are more than able? God, would you give us faith? We trust you. We need you. And then for that person today that's like, I'm in, man. I, I, I hear you. I need it. I just want to pray for you specifically. Just say out loud or in your heart, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I can't do it without you. Forgive me, God. Will you be my Savior? Will you be my Lord? God, would you change me from the inside out? Would you give me purpose? Would you give me direction? Would you help me understand my design so that I can get on to fulfilling my destiny? Jesus, would you help me today? God, we thank you for all that you're doing here in this place, in this church, in this room, in the lives of people. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our worship. We stand in awe of you, God. You gave everything, so Lord, we give you everything. In Jesus' name we pray.